Hi, good afternoon, um, everyone. This is the CDG, well, I'll just say the Climate Justice Design Fellowship Seminar Series, um, where we have speakers and we have um, welcome our mentors uh, to give talks around the work that we're doing. So we're delighted that Catherine Dale made us a mentor um, for Idalmis, and uh, she's Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Washington. I've had the pleasure, I think, over the last maybe decade of watching her work um, evolve and grow, and she's promised some new work today, so I'm very excited. Um, as she thinks about uh, life cycles and landscapes around broader issues of waste um, and how uh, material moves throughout the world and how that has influence on um, ecology and people and um, various issues and thinking kind of holistically and synthetically around uh, waste and material and landscape. So we're excited to have you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks, Jill. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, and thanks for that wonderful introduction. I'll go ahead and uh, share my screen. Uh, are you all seeing the presentation? We are. Okay, great. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk to you. Uh, so, I mean, as Jill said, I've been working on waste landscapes for a while and uh, my work continues to evolve. And um, uh, so I'm titling this presentation today, uh, Repairing Waste Relations. Um, a lot of my work has been focused on the relationships that are forged through uh, the movement of waste and the creation of waste landscapes. Um, and I'll be talking about landscape life cycles, which is sort of, I guess, my uh, lens and approach to understanding waste and waste landscapes, as well as participatory action research uh, at the margins. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, land acknowledgement. I'm in Seattle. Washington, and so I acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of this unceded ancestral land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And I also acknowledge the Pawnee in Lake of Nebraska, where I was before coming to Seattle, and the Cayuga tribe, um, also in Ithaca, where I was before going, before I was in Lincoln. Um, in all of these nations and, and places that I've worked and, and, uh, and lived. And so I acknowledge the people, the past, present, and future on whose traditional lands I have and continue to study and work and live and play. Um, to acknowledge this land is to recognize its longer history and our place in that history. It is to recognize these lands and waters and their significance for the peoples who lived and continue to live in this region whose practices and spiritualities were and are tied to the land and water, and whose lives continue to enrich and develop in relationship to the land, waters, and other environments today. Uh, so with that, um, I, so my work in my presentation will probably focus on topics related to waste. And so I like to always begin with a little bit of context for the work. Um, so, you know, when you hear the word waste, uh, you often sort of associate that with material leftovers like uh, garbage or um, debris and things like that. Um, but I also like to include uh, margins as part of that. And for me, it's a key term because margins implies space. It has spatial implications to it. And so when we think of margins, we tend to think of edges. But for me, margins don't only exist at the edge. They are also a trash can, uh, vacant lots located at centers of built environments, and underserved communities that are marginalized by oppressive systems that create environmental and social injustice. So margins are waste conditions that I see are present everywhere. Um, they're neglected byproducts of forgotten materials, spaces, and communities that are undervalued. So my landscape life cycles work uh, seeks to activate these marginalized, often abandoned conditions. Uh, what you're looking at here is a material flow diagram of sludge and sludge processing. Uh, and I really enjoy and I'm fascinated by diagrams like this. Um, for me, they uh, visually document how uh, things work, how different processes work. 
Uh, they illustrate interconnections and how each component impacts others. They describe hierarchies, both linear and nonlinear processes. Uh, what contributes to these processes both, and how materials flow and loop, where they get reincorporated into the process or where they might dead end. So inspired by diagrams like that one, I've developed a working diagram of my work in trajectory so far, um, which visualizes my constant desire to integrate and hybridize singular conditions. And I do this not only in my design research, but also in how I teach and engage with communities. All of the components influence each other. So this diagram documents the expansive qualities of my work and of waste as a topic, and the web of connections that become forged through each project that I work on. So my understanding of waste is multiplicitous and continues to grow um, through each project. And I've lived in a variety of different places that have informed the development of my work over the last decade. Um, and I've been at the University of Washington now for a little over three years. And although the geographical focus of my work in the Pacific Northwest is actively developing, and I'll be sharing uh, some of the stuff I'm working on now, um, I'll also share how the work um, I'm engaged in now is a continuation of early work I uh, did in both Ithaca when I uh, practiced there, as well as in Lincoln, Nebraska when I uh, was also teaching there. And so throughout this presentation, I'll unpack some of my work through speculative projects and studios, research and community engagement. And so in the spirit of this diagram, I'll share my work with you as these different threaded themes that lead to the continuous development of what I call landscape life cycles. So what is landscape life cycles? Uh, Western societies tend to think of systems such as economy, ecology, and culture as separate linear systems. Uh, through landscape life cycles, I think of these systems as intertwined and cyclical, uh, offering opportunities to create hybridity and complexity. Um, it rejects this notion that there is an end of life for materials and landscapes and recognizes that systems can become integrated through the exchange of waste materials from each process within each system. My work aspires to support communities uh, with engaging the spatial, aesthetic, and experiential opportunities of transforming waste landscapes with waste materials to address social and environmental injustices. Uh, landscape architecture is an interdisciplinary design practice that draws from uh, a variety of other fields, such as ecology and biology, urban design and planning, and geography, to name a few. And uh, I like to think of landscape architecture as a sort of generalist field um, where we are able to communicate with a wide variety of specialists from multiple disciplines, and each has a particular and unique focus. And I also see landscape architects as being uh, able to help facilitate uh, processes. So I look to a variety of different fields to inform my landscape life cycles work, um, which helps to broaden it with insights from many different disciplines. And so I see these fields as interwoven with points of overlap rather than as separate. So uh, going back to this diagram, I'm gonna first discuss a project I participated in when I was in professional practice, uh, which is part of this uh, waste landscapes thread and has been a foundational project for me that informs my work today. So um, when I was a design student prior to entering practice, I was really interested in exploring ways in which the same space or material can take on multiple identities. And this has expanded to include ideas of multifunctional landscape and ideas of adaptation and mixed use uh, continued for me with this project um, called the Chainwork District. And it's a project I worked on for over two years in professional practice. Uh, this work was significant for me because it not only relates directly to my academic interests um, today, but it also gave me the opportunity to better understand the challenges and opportunities of working on a deindustrialized Superfund site. So our team proposed a mixed use neighborhood that repurposes and adapts the existing structures of the Morris chain factory. Um, and that's the image that you see here. And so in Ithaca, um, it's known as the sleeping giant because it's been vacant for over a decade. 
So the site is very close to downtown Ithaca and can be seen from many different vantage points. It's located between downtown, uh, which you see here, and Ithaca College up here. And it's halfway up what's referred to as South Hill. In Ithaca, you have East Hill, West Hill, South Hill, um, sort of like nestled uh, around these different hills. And then Cayuga Lake is up here. Um, and so the site has some very challenging topography because it literally sits right up on a hill. But that also grants it with some very dramatic views. Um, you know, and so here's downtown Ithaca over here to the right, and then uh, Cayuga Lake there in the center. Uh, so I had the privilege of working and coordinating with a really big interdisciplinary team. It's probably the largest team I've ever been a part of. Um, and a site of the scale and complexity requires expertise from many different fields, such as traffic, um, environmental, traffic and environmental engineering, um, uh, and environmental engineering specifically for uh, helping us to address the contamination challenges, uh, environmental law, architecture, and public outreach, to name a few. So my role in this project was uh, as an associate at Woodham Planning and Design. And I helped with rezoning the site, uh, project planning approvals from the municipalities, and coordinating the state environmental quality review process. So the site has a long uh, and multifaceted history beginning at the turn of the century. Um, the Morse chain factory manufactured chains and led to innovations in the auto industry. As production grew over time, so did the overall complex and the added buildings over the course of 70 years leading to a facility, a full build out of over 800,000 square feet. So this is what the entrance to the site looks like. Um, and the interior photo you see is uh, inside the building to the right here. Um, so like really incredible spaces. And so we envisioned the adaptive reuse of the site as a live work play district consisting of a diverse mix of public and private uses and spaces. And another important piece of the project was creating a connection where there's currently a void in the regional trail network. So what you see here are the trail networks that connect to a variety of different state parks. And this is where the site is located. And so we saw um, the site as an opportunity to really connect uh, these trails. And so to do that, we also proposed the removal of pieces of several buildings where there's a greater degree of contamination. And this resulted in an internally and externally connective open space network, um, bridging the existing gap between Ithaca College and downtown. A variety of mixed use pro programming, uh, including manufacturing, uh, continue the site's legacy of productivity and workforce development. And so for me, this aspect of the project is incredibly important. Because uh, it brings back a level of industrial programming that once existed on the site, whereas many reclamation projects tend to take a more passive approach. And uh, in order to convert an industrially zoned site into a mixed use district, it needs to be rezoned. And so I helped to develop new zoning language, which, form, which follows form based code and lead ND guidelines. So Euclidean zoning, um, which is what uh, a lot of cities tend to use. It separates uses. So like this site was, was zoned as industrial, other sites are zoned as residential or commercial. Um, but form-based code allows you to integrate uses within a site. And it, dic it dictates the density and intensity of use between multiple programs. I was also the coordinator for the project's draft generic environmental impact statement. And I worked with our team members and the city and town municipalities. Should also mention that uh, you see this blue, I'll try to find my mouse here, you see this blue line here. Um, that is the line that separates the city of Ithaca from the town of Ithaca. Um, and so, two different municipalities, we have to go through review processes in both, um, as well as uh, rezoning process. And so, uh, we had to work with both of those municipalities um, and our team to develop the uh, draft generic environmental impact statement. So as you, keep, as you can see from this, the table of contents alone from this document, um, projects and sites of the scale and complexity require a large breadth of analysis 
from a wide variety of specialists from many different disciplines. And some of this analysis includes traffic, ecology, history, utilities, visual and aesthetic resources, public health, open space, and community character. And so this project provided me with the experience to understand the complexity of who and what it takes to realize the transformation of a Superfund site. And it also solidified the importance for me of continuing a site's legacy uh, through layered programming that enables varying degrees of economic, environmental, and social activities. And it also uh, highlighted the critical role that public engagement plays in these projects, as well as the ways in which these processes can be inequitable. So much of my research has uh, revealed how cultural attitudes towards waste uh, dictate the way it is mismanaged. And I see this as an emotional response rather than a rational one. And I see that these attitudes are not only applied to material spatial byproducts, but also marginalized communities, resulting in a thread that I call waste injustice, which I'll describe through an upcoming book chapter on environmental racism, a book chapter that came out about a year ago on uh, the citizenships of waste landscapes, uh, a few different design studios I've taught, and uh, two ongoing research projects I've been involved with in the Duwamish Valley and the Lower Duwamish Waterway Superfund site. So in my research, I've worked to reveal the correlation between brownfields, contamination, and racism. More often than not, communities located on or at the margins of brownfields are also at the periphery of social and political worlds. 20th century urban wastelands production is inseparable from constitutive processes of race and racism. These images of a predominantly Black population in Afton, North Carolina, protesting against the location of a PCB landfill in their community in 1989 are haunting, even more so because similar injustices continue to proliferate to this day. Images like these reveal that when contamination is moved off-site, it doesn't go away. It often goes to a marginalized community which lacks the political power to protect themselves. So the more I work on marginal waste landscapes, the more I'm struck by these injustices that are caused by waste mismanagement, often experienced by the communities that reside in these landscapes. And so this research, uh, which I published in the book, uh, Landscape Citizenships that came out last year, focuses on defining what belonging means in the context of waste landscapes. I found that some communities are forced to become active citizens to protest toxic or dangerous conditions and that some choose to adopt a more approachable waste landscapes. The Love Canal incident, uh, the images of which you see here um, at the top, uh, led to the establishment of a Superfund program in the United States. And it was intended to dedicate federal resources to clean up our worst toxic landscapes. Decades later though, the dream is far from realized. In St. Louis, Missouri, the Westlake Superfund site is a smoldering landfill of radioactive waste from the Manhattan Project, located in a poor Hispanic community, images of which you see at the bottom. On the flip side, some waste landscapes are not dangerous and present a potential for developing more productive relationships with waste conditions. I call this voluntary, voluntary citizenships, which for me occurs when members of a community willingly adopt an emergent condition. This is the Leslie Street Spit, which is located in Toronto, Canada, and is, it is now one of the top bird sanctuaries in the world, but it grew out of and remains an active construction debris landfill. So waste in this case is the impetus for integrating uses and communities together that would normally not exist in the same space. Waste often elicits undesirable emotional responses, but here people have begun to see opportunity. Citizenships can be, for, can be fostered uh, by making waste intentionally visible, creating productive relationships with waste as a common ground through enhancing legibility, fostering a sense of responsibility, and empowering citizens to become agents of change. And I elaborate on these ideas in an upcoming book chapter on waste and justice. In this piece, I discuss not only how productions and concentrations of waste tend to occur in BIPOC communities, but also how their cleanup through green gentrification further displaces. 
Such practices are only a few of many ways white supremacy is spatialized. Who drives decision making and who owns a project determines who benefits from such projects. And I argue how tenets of whiteness include the establishment of singular segmented identities and linear models of production, and that waste landscapes offer opportunities for questioning white supremacist frameworks by shifting to more fluid conceptualizations of space through modes of plurality and cyclical systems. So this ongoing research motivates the development of my service learning and community engaged design studios, which began when I was an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and continued to evolve uh, here at University of Washington. So these design courses are grounded in principles of participatory action research, which combines critical pedagogy and active learning with community generated activism research outcomes and service. And so I'll share a few design studios from both Nebraska and then a more recent one uh, that was based on the Duwamish Valley in Seattle. So in fall 2017, I partnered with the rural city of Daring um, to look, and this is in Western Nebraska, uh, to look at a brownfield site in a predominantly Hispanic neighborhood. Students attended meetings with stakeholders and community members and developed proposals that engage with the site's conditions, reinvigorating the community by providing amenities that don't currently exist in their neighborhood. I believe uh, digital technologies can bring visibility to the invisible and provide a voice for the voiceless. And so in the fall of 2018, I began to integrate drone mapping into the studio and into the work engaging with both rural and urban communities who lack equitable data access for community development projects. I find this technological tool for documenting underrepresented marginal landscapes to be incredibly powerful. It enables the precise real-time acquisition of site data, generating 3D geolocated topographic models of a site and its context. Drone documentation supports the simultaneous collection of qualitative and quantitative data, which can be synthesized as georeferenced uh, GIS, which is a mapping software um, data for further analysis and integration into the design process. And so I'll demonstrate this with the work produced in a third year undergraduate studio at UNL. In this studio, I uh, partnered with the Omaha Municipal Land Bank, which owns hundreds of vacant lots in Northeast Omaha, Nebraska. Underprivileged communities of color are the primary residents of these neighborhoods. We met and worked with stakeholders throughout the process. And I'll share a project from a student group to describe the process and methods. So we were given three nearby sites with the request that these sites be temporarily activated to stimulate community engagement and future development. This project was heavily grounded in mapping the context of these sites. And so this exercise revealed to the students the stark disparity between demographics, income, and the lack of food, art, and recreational programming in the neighborhood when compared with other more affluent neighborhoods. The group developed an array of seasonal programming around certain holidays, uh, proposing to partner with different local organizations. They also created a traveling art board for community engagement activities to solicit feedback on the future use of the sites, working across multiple scales from the site and neighborhood down to uh, the material. Then the students zoomed back out and they tested on how their project would impact walking scores and amenities that their project could provide as it travels and activates other vacant lots. So this work has informed uh, recent projects I am currently engaged in, uh, which is focused on the Duwamish River watershed and Superfund area in Southwest Seattle. If you're not familiar with Seattle, um, it's in Northwest Washington state um, and downtown Seattle is about here. And the area that I'm talking about is over here, um, which is in South Seattle, the Duwamish River. And this blue line you see here is what the river used to be like um pre 1900s uh, uh before the shoreline was filled in and became a an industrial uh, canal and channel for uh, the industries that now reside within the Duwamish valley 
Um, and so uh, on the right, um, you see images of uh, the north side of the river looking south. So these images are sort of taken here, looking this way. And this landmass you see here is this landmass over here. And uh, these images you see uh, are both are documented with a drone, uh, which is part of the research I've been doing there. And I'll talk more about that. So uh, I've been working with several colleagues across the University of Washington and three campuses. And uh, this transdisciplinary research project supports uh, Duwamish tribal and grassroots action throughout uh, the watershed assessment of Puget Creek, um, which I guess to go back, uh, Puget Creek is one of the tributaries of the Duwamish River that you see here. Um, and uh, so throughout this project, we developed what we call the Duwamish Valley Research Coordination Network, which has two main objectives. The first is to provide a collective repository of data and research that has occurred in the watershed over the last several decades in order to increase access to this data and provide a structure for future action. The second has been convening academics, scientists, and community members to help facilitate the building of community science capacity by connecting needs to expertise. So my primary role in this project has been to support vis vis yeah, visualization and mapping efforts um, of the watershed and water quality monitoring by other members of our team. And I continue to employ drone mapping as a method for collecting real-time site data. The initial data we collected around Puget Creek led to the identification of areas that are more prone to soil erosion and areas to collect soil and water samples. Some areas of the creek, which uh, you can see our wonderful uh, student researchers pointing out over here, um, have CKD, which is an acronym for cement kiln dust. Um, and this was dumped by neighboring industries and is contributing to an increase in alkalinity in the water and soil. This is affecting the health of living beings residing within this area. So we're continuing this project um, through other grant funding, which we've recently received, but I can't publicly share what it is yet until the entity publicly announces it sometime in the next month. Um, but we're very excited about this upcoming three-year project. Um, where we will be engaging with other community organizations, including the Duwamish River Community Coalition and the Environmental Coalition of South Seattle by providing resources for additional water quality monitoring and soil contamination studies. And this research will inform which areas to target for future remediation and ongoing monitoring. And so this work has highlighted for me the important role that landscape architects can play in facilitating processes that are driven by community needs and actions. My research in the Duwamish Valley and on waste systems has become a strong focus of my advanced graduate design studios here at the University of Washington. So last spring quarter, um, students documented, we started the class with students documenting the relational waste legacies of the region with a strong focus on the Duwamish Valley demonstrating how waste has reconfigured and polluted this river. Waste continues to move through and concentrate in this region. Topics of analysis included documenting material industries that have and continue to generate toxic and non-toxic forms of waste, such as cement manufacturing, which you see here. Um, and so the students mapped their material movements and outputs geographically and through material processing diagrams as well as through time, documenting their legacies and also speculating on what might, uh, what effects might continue into the future. Other topics of analysis included the stormwater and wastewater management systems of the area, uh, which are contributors to uh, the Superfund site, um, and how the construction of combined sewer overflows through the 1960s has had long-standing effects on the river and the health of the water bodies within the region as a whole. Students also documented efforts that are taking place to mitigate these effects, such as the construction of wet weather treatment stations, um, which basically hold water during overflow events uh, to prevent CSO discharge. 
Other research also entailed documenting the histories that led to the designation of the Lower Duwamish Waterway as a Superfund site. So this student illustrated this by following sediments in their transport, describing how dredging has not only been used to make things shipping channels in the Lower Duwamish River, but also to extract contaminated sediments, only to be uh, what they describe as burrito wrapped. Um, in train cars and shipped to the Roosevelt landfill that is 250 miles away, where it is used as a daily cover for garbage. So around the same time, um, I was connected with the Duwamish Valley Sustainability Association, uh, so DVSA is uh, short for that, as well as Sustainable Seattle, or S2, and you'll hear, hear me referring to these community organizations that way. Um, who have been working on developing a pilot project for a community-owned anaerobic biodigester to divert food waste and create a series of beneficial byproducts for other community organizations to use. However, how the project lands and the potentials and opportunities this project has were questions they have brought forward. And they're really interested in developing this within um, the South Park community and neighborhood, which is located here I mean, sort of nestled within uh, this in industrial corridor of Seattle. And so this led to a series of uh, case studies that students researched that were really focused on, uh, or uh, yeah, focused on community driven um, zero waste initiatives. So for example, the student studied uh, Kamikatsu in Japan, uh, which is uh, known as a zero waste community. And they've developed uh, 13 types from 48 categories uh, to sort residents' waste uh, for recycling. But one of the case studies that uh, DVSA has been looking to as a model is Zero Waste Vashon, um, which is uh, located on Vashon Island, uh, which is across the Puget Sound from Seattle. And they They've used, um, on Vashon Island, they've used the installation of a biodigester to catalyze a series of zero waste initiatives within the community from uh, fix-it cafes to uh, waste to garden projects. So the biodigester converts food scraps into compost, biogas, and liquid fertilizer. And this is a model that DVSA hopes to adapt to the South Park neighborhood um, which is a frontline community in the Duwamish Valley that is adjacent to the Superfund site and is experiencing a variety of injustices from gentrification to air pollution from neighboring industries and the highways. So our conversations quickly evolved into a partnership and uh, we kicked things off with a design charrette, which is basically a creative brainstorming session uh, with our students and members of DVSA and S2, as well as Duwamish Valley Youth, who DVSA engages with, and they do a variety of programs with, uh, um, with basically high school students in the area. And so they worked in four teams of three. Um, our, our, our students worked in four teams of three, and uh, they came to the charrette with some initial ideas for the biodigester project. And, uh, and so they shared these ideas with the youth and DVSA and S2 stakeholders. And they were able to learn from the students about their daily experiences um, and, uh, and ideas for um, what they wanna see happen in their neighborhood. And so we closed the session out by developing visioning boards, which you can see here, in which each team merged the initial students' ideas uh, with the hopes, desires, and creative visions for our young community members. And these collages became an, an important touchstone for, um, for our students as they developed their projects further. Uh, our students presented their projects to local professionals, um, some colleagues I have here at the University of Washington, and to community members to solicit their feedback but more importantly, to spark a, a discussion on how a community-owned biodigester um, can serve as a catalyst towards developing a just circular neighborhood in South Park. So uh, four projects offered visions for how the biodigester might become phased and what other phases of development could be propelled by these efforts. Additionally, each group provided visions for how these efforts could lead to community-owned infrastructures 
and help support local economies and community wealth building. And so I'll share more details about two projects. Um, so in this first project, uh, these students called it Food Co, um, which is basically this idea of uh, combining containers with uh, food waste and production with community. Um, so the Port of Seattle is one of the most important ports uh, in uh, the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so we have a, a big influx of containers um, that, get left, get left, that get left behind, um, as well as a variety of other sort of community uh, landmarks, such as Mara Farm and the Duwamish River Community Hood Pub. And Food Lifeline, which is a food bank, is the location of the biodigester. And so uh, inspired by some of the exercises they did with the youth, um, this group, they brought Legos in and they were already thinking about containers and uh, they were sort of working with the youth to think about creative ways of dismantling or, or using containers and, um, in, in exciting and innovative ways. And so um, the students documented how the container would get taken apart and the different ways it could be reconfigured. Um, to lead to what the, what the biodigester space could be and could become. So here you can see how uh, so this is a food lifeline, food bank, and the ways in which that the biodigester can sort of catalyze a variety of different uh, events uh, and spaces, as well as uh, you know, sort of starting to set up a series of infrastructures for it, um, including uh, power uh, for electric bikes, um, and uh, things like that. And then they began to sort of think about how that can scale up into bus stops. You can have the buses that are powered by the gas that comes out of the biodigester. And, uh, so this other project uh, called Ground Up, this group of students is really interested in ideas of addressing the contamination um, through uh, both depaving and soil building that were also both sparked by the biodigester. And so uh, this group was really interested in sort of uh, pushing back against the way that different material processes happen within the, um, within the valley and really interested in how uh, community wealth building can happen through cycling materials back into the community. So they looked at a variety of different phases with phase one being the biodigester and beginning to test a depaving strategy uh, in that space and how that could then uh, lead to a variety of uh, sort of soil building activities and deep paving and a series of studies um, as a way of beginning to address the contamination of this neighborhood. And so uh, this work is continuing. Um, uh, I'm continuing to work with both DVSA and S2 on a number of different efforts from applying for more grant funding to participating in events that they're hosting. Uh, they see me as a stakeholder in this process and uh, uh, providing uh, ways to sort of think about not only how the biodigester lands um, in the site, but also how it can scale up and how the different byproducts that can come out of the biodigester can support other community efforts. Um, and so we'll be uh, sort of building on that work uh, this upcoming spring. Uh, I'll be teaching an interdisciplinary, uh, what we call a BE studio, which is built environment at the college that I'm in. Um, and we'll be sort of testing, uh, well, sort of scaling up uh, this work at the neighborhood scale, but also uh, really interested in finding ways in which uh, these landscape systems can become integrated into building systems and help to support uh, the development of affordable housing. And so uh, it's through uh, these projects and ongoing conversations, um, we're really starting to test how an abstract concept like the circular economy model can serve frontline communities and begin to address waste and justice. And so to uh, sort of close things out, um, the background image you see here is uh, Gasworks Park, um, which is an important project that's located here in Seattle. It's one of the first projects that took a, an industrial um, landscape and turned it into a park and began to address contamination issues. Um, and so while these 
well, projects like this one are really important. I also think it's, uh, well, I guess I think they are, they kind of follow a one track uh, approach where they result in traditional parks. But I believe that landscapes and, and waste warrant more diversified nuanced approaches that can result in decentralized outcomes and more interconnected uh, typologies and site uses and materials um, that can then support community efforts uh, more specifically and become more place specific. And so uh, hopefully the, some of the research and student projects I've shared um, help to demonstrate potential opportunities and a variety to which margins are assets for imagining uh, future possibilities. So thank you all so much for tuning in and uh, looking forward to your questions and to the conversation. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much um, for sharing. Are there questions? People have questions. Maybe I'll start just with a question around um, how you form the partnerships and maybe what steps you take to make them, I guess, uh, reciprocal or not necessarily extractive and how you see those like long-term engagements with some of the communities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I guess like with the first project that I shared um, where we're like, uh, where, we, where we're building out this sort of Duwamish Valley research coordination network, um, I, I guess like with BVSA also, any grants that we apply for, uh, community members are co-PIs. And that's super, super important uh, for us because like we sort of, like they, like community members need to be leading the projects. And we're here to provide like the institutional support, the, um, you know, other support, helping to build out um, sort of community science capacity, you know, having access to labs and testing and things like that. Um, you know, we can help to support those efforts, but it's really, having the community members drive the projects and the decision-making is like number one priority, um, as well as building into these budgets time that community members spend on working on the projects. And so we ensure that, um, uh, that there's like, that there, that there is money set aside for that kind of participation. Yeah, that, that's nice to hear. And then in terms of on the other side of the of the grant, um, how, how do you see the, I guess, the results? Yeah, um, well, I guess we also, and I, we've written this into the grant as well as like the data and knowledge that is produced is owned by the community. And so like the, the repositories that will be uh, building and 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 uh, and I guess like coalescing, like it'll all be publicly accessible, but also the community will will own all of it. And so we also see our role as like um, not only like developing the research, but also developing the processes and the like um, the infrastructure for doing the data collection and collecting that data and being able to sort of build off of the infrastructure that we help them set up. And so it, it is a sort of like, we're helping community groups to set up the, the infrastructure and the testing and the data collection and all of like whatever is required. But then we're also creating a series of um, sort of like instructional manuals for how they can continue to, to build that work out. Like a lot of the work that the um, DRCC, which is a Duwamish River Community Coalition, um, they've really been like the core community advocates in the Duwamish Valley for like, they, they've been putting pressure on the EPA to address these things. And in order for them to do that, they've been working with researchers at UW to do air quality testing and monitoring. And it's the sort of like, having to track it over time to actually demonstrate the longer term impacts of, of what is happening there. 
And so they've mostly been doing it with air quality. Uh, that's what they've had capacity for, but we're helping to build that out through uh, water and soil as well. Amazing. Hi, Catherine. I have a question. Thank you so much for your lecture. I'm an MLA and MDES student at the GSD, and um, your projects are really relevant to my current work. I'm doing uh, working with female waste pickers in Bolivia, and most of the waste going to Bolivia are a uh, compost. So our group is really interested in working with soil and um, bioremediating the compost, but there's a real pressure from the community who are more interested in short-term uh, profits through recycling like plastic and metals. So my question is, how do you go about um, convincing stakeholders that um, looking at the long-term, looking at the soil and the ecologies are actually productive and can help communities make money because it seems like there's, uh, it's very hard to find evidence of like, I guess, plant-based solutions um, generating income. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I mean, I think like, I think it's important to sort of document not only like this long-term vision and providing what that vision is, but I think what's even more important is like demonstrating how you get there. So what are the steps to like getting to that, like that goal that you see, right? As a designer, long-term thinker, like you can see the like benefits of doing that. Um, it's sort of like, you know, one role that designers do play is being able to communicate like not only, hey, like this is beneficial and here's why, but you know, I think what it really comes down to is like, how does it help community members? And how do you actually like make something like this community owned where you can, where it can contribute to um, workforce development and, uh, and like, and support, yeah, community wealth building and, and things like that. I mean, maybe one other thing to just like take an idea from your presentation is that perhaps you don't have to do one or the other. And so maybe there's also an argument to be made as to how you kind of distribute time and resource towards multiple ends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We have a couple more minutes. I don't know if anyone else has a question. Um, I guess I'll ask one last question then since, you know. Yeah, um, sure. You see, I mean, I think in terms of it's clear the kind of tangible results in, in improving the, the actual physical landscape. Do you ever see the research as um, enabling types of legislation or like other kinds of um, policy or advocacy driven outcomes? Yeah, absolutely. And that, um, yeah. And uh, I guess like, I mean, where my head is at right now is like mostly like the, the conversations I've been having with DVSA and S2 around um, around the biodigester and like um, folks at DVSA really see it as uh, as a as a as a starting point for a circular economy. We're developing a circular economy within the South Park neighborhood, um, and a lot of our conversations have sort of as as we've talked more about circular economy. You know, we've sort of landed, you know, there's like people working on it. There are policies that are being developed around circular economy models, but a lot of it is very abstract and is not applicable to frontline communities or communities that are dealing with contamination or communities that are dealing with displacement. Um, and so where our conversations are going now is, well, what does a just circular model look like? And what are the policies that we could develop? Like, you know, they, we were, 
they're in discussions with King County and City of Seattle. Um, they have funding from both of those municipalities. And there is a lot of interest um, from the municipal side of things as well, of like what is a circular economy or a circular community actually look like? Um, and how could we actually legislate that? So those are like much bigger questions that I think are coming out of um, you know this like very small pilot biodigester, which is like basically this like it's like a I've heard it described as like a stomach. It functions like a stomach, and it just like and it's all within a container. Um, so uh, yeah, how that can sort of lead to this like bigger thing is. Um, I don't know. That to me is like the really exciting part and, and what those opportunities are. And then on a totally unrelated question, how did you form the partnerships to begin with? Yeah. Um, so the first one with the, so the first project I shared, um, that was initially with the Duwamish tribe. Um, and uh, that, Honestly, it's just like been a lot of, I don't know, just like, I feel incredibly lucky. Um, so that first partnership, I got connected to these researchers at University of Washington through someone I met through like a, um, there's something called the Center for Teaching and Learning and they have like these teaching workshops and I was attending them and I met someone in a different, like totally different college and discipline. And we like got connected and, we were like geeking out about e-waste and then she got connected to someone else and she connected me to them. And then we were on a team and we applied for this grant uh, working with the Duwamish tribe, which one of the researchers was already sort of connected to them. And um, that's sort of what led to the Puget Creek and the build out of the Duwamish Valley Research Coordination Network. And so it was like through that project, we got connected to each other and to community groups. And then that has led to this other bigger, longer term grant that, um, that I can't share too much about right now. Um, and then the other one, the DVSA and S2, I got connected to them through a former student. Um, so we, uh, my, one of my thesis students from two years ago who graduated and was really interested in doing community work uh, was doing work for them and then uh, yeah, she connected us and then it's sort of like exploded from there. So um, yeah, I, I, I just consider myself very lucky um, and people are connecting me to other people. And, um, and that's, I mean, there's so much exciting work happening in Seattle, um, a lot of different community groups and so much overlap. And that was actually one of the goals of this uh, research coordination network was to create like one place where you can access all the different things that have been happening in the Duwamish Valley because it has sort of been like project by project or group by group. So anyway, yeah. Very cool. Well, we are at time and I can imagine a diagram that you like to draw of the kind of connections of a project or like the making. I think the Good project themselves are awesome, but also I think we're all excited about how do we, you know, um, expand what we're trying to do, I guess, scale what we're trying to do both in terms of that. So I can just imagine, yeah, this constellation of connections, but mm. thank you. Very impressive. Um, thank you. That was great. Yeah, see where it goes. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. Bye. Take care. Thank you.